Hello and welcome to the first, maybe, of a series of uh, monthly question and answer sessions. I'm trying this out for the first time, so if this ends up being of interest or helpful or whatever to you, please let me know in the comments or in some other way so that I know to make more of them. Because if it's not of interest or helpful, I'm not going to make more of them. So yeah, it's very important to me that I hear from you if you do enjoy it, so please let me know. I'm just going to be responding to questions that come in uh, from viewers and community members and whatever via Discord, via YouTube comments, via emails I get, whatever it happens to be. And uh, they'll use this as a time to explain or to comment on certain topics more in depth than I can through a simple text response or whatever. Um, there's going to be an audio version of this. I don't know where it's going to be hosted right now because I'm just doing this sort of spontaneously. So probably there's going to be a link in the description and eventually if uh, people are into this sort of thing, I'll have some way to host these audio versions more regularly in case you want to listen in the car or walking or whatever. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can just by putting a comment on this video. I'll look at the comments in this video as well as all the comments I get across YouTube and pull questions from there as well. There's a channel in the Discord if you're in, if you're in that uh, Discord community, Sonic Sorcery, which there's a link to in the description of the video. And if you leave a comment in there in the channel called uh, Questions for Max, I think it's called, at least for now, then I'll take those questions as well. And I'm just going to take the ones that I feel are most applicable or I have something to say about and sort of respond to them in a sort of free, off-the-cuff sort of way here, sort of conversationally, and see what comes up. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just say thank you to everybody who's been supporting the channel and is part of the community. And even if you're not in the Discord or whatever, still thank you for your comments and your views and your likes and your support or whatever it is. I really appreciate all that. And uh, this wouldn't be anything without you. So thanks for that. All right. So there's a bunch of questions here to get into. Um, some of them were were personal questions, let's say, about myself, which is fine. It's not really what I'm doing this for, but it, but I'm happy to answer it too. I'll just put them at the end though, and I'll, I'll deal with the ones that are more about music, production, theory, composition, ear training, whatever, uh, up first, and then we'll look at those other ones after. And maybe if there's time at the end, I'll make some additional comments on ear training, because um, that's sort of up at the moment for me anyway. I've been thinking about it. Um, before I begin, I guess I just want to say, remember that it's totally okay to be yourself and to be who you are naturally when it comes to music, when it comes to life. There's no need to try to conform to anything. There's no specific way to make music, no specific sound, no specific anything you need to do or be or whatever. You know, it's totally open to just uh, experiment and discover. It's, you know, that's the joy of it for me. <laughs> So anyway, here's question one. This is a somewhat personal question, but I found it funny, so I'm going to open with it. You seem to take your work and your videos very seriously. You also appear to be pretty serious in your videos. Are there moments when you can be silly and what actually does make you laugh? Well, I think anybody that knows me, or at least watches the streams, would know that I'm laughing a lot. Well, a lot. Anyway, I am laughing and I can be pretty silly. So if you just watch some of the stream highlight videos, you'll probably get the picture pretty quick. But that being said, I am pretty serious in other ways too, and uh, serious about music, because I don't know why, that's just how I am. So there's some sort of blend of the two, and that's all I can say about it. I found the question funny though. Question two, I'm interested in trying to make exciting drum beats, patterns, and in the absence of addictive drums, where to start with battery, impact, or any of the other native instruments, drum instruments? So. Addictive Drums is the uh, acoustic drum uh, sampler that I'm using basically all the time when it comes to having acoustic drums in my songs. I just love it. But this person's saying, uh, in the absence of that, where do I start with battery, which is a sampler, impact, which is a sampler, or some other native instruments, drum instruments? So the main thing when it comes to drums, of course, is samples and patterns uh, and programming, if you want to lump that together. So I have a couple of videos if you haven't seen them. If anyone hasn't seen them, they're called um, like realistic drum programming or something like that. And you can find them on the channel. There's two parts to it. One is all about choosing samples. And I use Battery 4 from Native Instruments for that, which I just love that plugin. It's amazing. And then I uh, have a second one about pattern creation. Now, of course, this stuff is about creating realistic drums. That is drums that sort of sound like they were played by a human which for some reason I'm really into doing that kind of thing. 
I don't know why, I just really like it. But I also really like sampled sort of electronic hip hop style drums as well. And it really depends upon obviously what the song is needing, where you're going to start with that. But as far as uh, this question goes, where to start with? Well, to start with is to make sure you have samples on hand that are halfway decent. It makes a huge difference to have nice samples. And there's many ways to get those. They can come included in, in the plugin itself, like battery comes with a whole sample bank, of course. Uh, or you can buy individual sample packs or get a subscription to Splice and get your samples there. Whatever it is, you basically need to have opinions about drum sounds, like what sounds you like, and then you build up a collection of those. So that's essential. Without those, obviously, you're not going to be making any drum beats. And then you'll need a knowledge of patterns, obviously, like actually what the drum beats are. And I got this knowledge just from watching drummers. Yeah, I also learned to play drums at some point, just a little bit. I'm not a good drummer by any means, but I've watched a lot of drummers play. And I still, to this day, all the time, I'm watching drummers play. Just playing beats, soloing, giving tutorials, master classes, talking about it, whatever. I just want to hear from people and watch people who live and breathe the instrument, do what they do. And then both through osmosis uh, and through actual, like, trying to replicate and analyze what they're doing, I learn how it all works, how, what the certain drums do and how they normally play them and how to articulate things in different feels and whatever. So a lot of that comes from exposure and listening like anything does in music. So if you want to be able to make exciting drum beats and patterns, you need samples and you need patterns. So samples get bought, patterns get learned. Patterns generally get learned through um, watching people do it. Basically, that's how I do it anyway. But I will make a whole course on doing drum programming as well because it's something I'm really into. So you can stay tuned for that. In the meantime, just watch some drum tutorials of literally people teaching how to play drums. Uh, and then just internalize those concepts and you'll be able to translate them to programmed drums uh, instead of playing real drums, although learning to play real drums is pretty cool too. That's all I got to say about that one. When you went from a beginner to an intermediate harmonizer, did you learn your thick THICC chord voicings and progressions from transcription, theory, or were there creative practices, uh, creative practice techniques that helped you discover the sound you were after? It's a good question. So the sound I was after uh, initially came from watching a video of a, of a vocal jazz group called Take Six do a performance of uh, the Star Spangled Banner American National Anthem. I saw that when I was 15 or 16, and it just completely blew my mind in so many ways, but primarily the actual harmony, the actual chords and voicings and movements and whatever. I had not really heard anything quite like that before, and it just, I was like, this is it. <laughs> you know, this is what I need to, like, focus my, my life on, basically, is figuring out how to do this. And so the following years were sort of all about that. And I, I absolutely spent a lot of time studying the theory from books and videos and courses and whatever I could find on jazz theory. I shouldn't say jazz theory, but jazz harmony and uh, all those just dense uh, chords and interesting movements and blah, blah, blah. So for me, I did need that. I didn't have the kind of ear that could just pick out what was going on there and just sort of figure it out. Not at all. So instead, I had to start with theory and come to some sort of comprehension intellectually of what even is this? What is a minor ninth chord? And why does it go there instead of there? And so on. And all of this sort of thinking helped me get a handle on the, on the thing in general and then be able to start experimenting. And that experimenting was really just working on my instruments, piano and guitar, building the chords, listening to them, playing the progressions that I saw in the books and wherever else, analyzing those, taking the theory that the person was trying to give, as well as coming up with my own, I don't know what you'd say, my own analysis in terms of, you know, how these things are working. Um, I have my own internal vocabulary, harmonic vocabulary, and a certain way of organizing it, let's say, that I keep track of, and anything new that I find, I, you know, kind of slot it into that library of a sort, which consists of chord types, chord voicings, chord movements, key changes, inner voice movement, voice leading, you know, all this is just this big whatever it is going on in my mind, like it is for anybody. And I just, over the years, had this sound in mind, and I really wanted to build that up. So theory was first, and then came transcribing. I did a lot of that, and I still do a lot of that. Anything that just strikes me, some kind of chord, voicing, movement, progression, key change, whatever, and I just say, man, I need that. 
I will get it. <laughs> you know, I'm determined to. So I'll sit down and uh, headphones on, loop the thing over and over again in some app or in the DAW or whatever, slow it down if I need to, pick out things as accurately as possible, and really just try to get a, a perfect representation of what's going on, and then start analyzing in this uh, way that I sort of mentioned, trying to insert it into this mental vocabulary by generalizing the principles that I'm seeing. So for instance, if uh, I, at some point, pick a chord at random, uh, in major keys, there's a, a thing where you play a flat seven chord. So if you're in C, C major, and then you'd play a B flat dominant chord, and there's a bunch of extensions you can put on there, but let's just call it B flat dominant for now, B flat seven. That was at some point a new thing to me, and I was really interested in that sound. I really loved it. And so I started to pick that apart and say, what, what is this? What's making it what it is? And for instance, in that case, the flat seventh degree of the key appears, that's B flat in this case, as well as the flat sixth degree of the key, A flat in this case, appears. So you think about a B flat seventh chord, uh, B flat, D, F, and A flat. There's two notes there that are non-diatonic, and all of a sudden they appear in a key where prior to that they weren't appearing. So I'll look at that and try to generalize the principle, which is that these two degrees appear all of a sudden when a moment ago they didn't appear. And so instead of thinking of the chord just as B flat 7 or even as flat 7 dominant in a major key, Rather, I'm, I'm trying to even generalize it even further and say, right, it's these two non-diatonic degrees that are suddenly coming into the picture. And then I start to iterate on that and say, what are some other ways to get those non-diatonic degrees uh, into the picture? And there's many, many other chords that can do that and inversions and whatever. From there, there's a study of where can I place these chords in progressions and I'm trying things and whatever. That process happens all the time for me. I mean, I just come across new music that has certain changes that just excite me. And then I just say, I need that, I need to insert that into the vocabulary so that when I'm writing, it's available to me. Or even if that specific change isn't available, something like it that gets the essence of it in this generalized way uh, becomes possible. Um, yeah, so that's sort of how it went for me. Theory first, transcribing, both of those still go on today, building up an inner vocabulary, and then a lot of practice on the instrument doing just little compositional exercises, either just writing progressions, writing melodies and harmonizing them, reharmonizing like famous melodies or melodies that I like and know. And when I'm doing all that, uh, for instance, if I'm working on, I've got a melody and I'm going to reharmonize it uh, for practice, each chord that I'm choosing, I spend a very long time. Like on stream, I'm just taking the first thing that comes to me and saying I have to go. But when I'm actually doing it myself and studying, you know, I spend half an hour choosing one chord because I want to try every possible variation, every extension type, every, every everything, every inversion of that thing, every substitution for that chord, because only through exploring in this thorough way do you really get a handle on it. You know, there's just so many possibilities in music <laughs> to about how to harmonize. It's just ridiculous. And so there's a lot of exploration that has to happen in one way or another, and that's my way of doing it. Theory, transcription, and then these sort of constrained compositional exercises where I'm putting the things into practice, and but not just the thing, but every possible variation of the thing that I can conceive of, and how the bass would move, and the voice leading would work, and what does that do to the melody, and blah, blah, blah. You know, that's its own whole thing, which again, I'll have a course, uh, hopefully later this year on Advanced Harmony that will release Advanced Harmony, and that will come out and talk all about that stuff. Hopefully that's helpful. Okay, next question. This one, uh, I actually originally wrote this question. Orchestral writing interests me, but it's also very intimidating. Do you have any thoughts? And then someone in the community said, hey, that's my question too. So I said, well, okay, I'll include it in here. I just gave it as an example question. This could be something that someone would ask uh, for this Q&A. And someone said, yeah, I asked that. So uh, to begin with, to talk about this, this orchestral writing being intimidating, I'll just tell a brief story. When I was younger, uh, yeah, definitely over a decade ago, I can't remember when exactly, I had a person in my life that was kind of acting as a mentor at the time. This person was a, a film and TV composer, and we would get together and talk music and a variety of things. So one night we were having dinner or something, and somehow this topic came up of orchestral writing, and, and he asked me, you know, oh, and do you write orchestral stuff? I said, no, you know, I'm not really interested in doing that. 
At the time, I was writing mainly beat-based music, as, as I still do, um, hip-hop and electronic music and whatever, pop stuff and such. And so I said, no, it doesn't really interest me, which is not true. Orchestral music has always massively interested me. I mean, heard Star Wars as a kid and it was over. You know, I listened to a lot of classical music when I was growing up as well. So it was very much in me. But then this guy said, oh, well, are you sure it's not because you're scared or intimidated? I said, yeah, <laughs> that's probably why. I, I guess that's why. And that was pretty illuminating for me to see that, yeah, I'm intimidated to try this because I had always been the sort of person that didn't want to jump into something that I didn't really understand or know how to do. And writing orchestrally just seemed like this massive undertaking is so many instruments with so many articulations and blah, blah, blah. And it's all, you know, monophonic for the most part, right? Like each instrument is monophonic where I'd come from a background of playing these harmonic instruments, piano and guitar, and thinking a lot of music in that way, that music is, you know, chords, literally chords being played on a single instrument with a melody on top. Maybe there's a counter melody, but then there's bass and drums and that was kind of it. And this idea that of all the counterpoint and interweaving lines and blah, 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 it just seemed like, I don't know how to do any of this. So it was still many years after that until I started trying in earnest to write anything orchestral. I still felt intimidated by it. And there's also so much to explore already in the world of music outside of orchestral that I didn't really take the time to focus on it. But there came a point, I guess, just after studying a bunch of seemingly unrelated things. I wasn't actually studying orchestration or whatever. I was just studying uh, Baroque harmony and voice leading and all that on the guitar and the piano and really thinking about inner motion and whatever, and really started to get the sort of get the idea. And I should say actually transcribing the vocal music of Take Six and a bunch of other other groups doing choir bass music, transcribing that and understanding the principles of how these individual voices that are all just singing one note are combining together to uh, outline chord changes while still having their own independent lines moving. I started to get a handle on that to some degree, and that kind of made the orchestral thing feel more uh, doable. I was like, right, okay, so there is like a melody and some kind of harmony of the moment, generally speaking. You know, that, that still exists, just like in the way I had always thought. It's just that the harmony is spread across all these instruments, and these instruments can be either playing very independently their own lines or they can be moving together like in a string section or a brass section or whatever. And that combined with the voice leading and everything started to make me feel like, right, okay, I have a now sort of a conceptual basis about how to even attack this and let me start trying. And that just evolved over the years, but it's still to this day not been a huge focus for me despite uh, I would love for it to be a focus for me because I love that music so much, but I love so much music so much, so it's hard to just devote myself to one thing. I'm sure it will come in some time. So in terms of uh, someone else who feels that it's intimidating, understanding these basic principles that still it's just harmony and melody, and then understanding that you're going to be writing all of these individual notes that are going to make up the harmony, but it's still some big chord, but they have freedom to move in different ways. That alone probably isn't enough for a person to be like, okay, I got it, Max, let me just go do it now. But at least in general, that's what's happening. And then the specifics of how those lines move and the voice leading between them and whatever, that can be covered by either listening a lot to the music and just absorbing it, but not being taken by the melody, trying to listen into the music and hearing what's going on with those inner instruments, or by studying, transcribing and studying, or by reading a book on orchestration or whatever. That's not essential, though. You don't have to do any of that. If you're the kind of person that just wants to get in and get their hands dirty, then just do that. You know, just start writing orchestrally and see what happens. You're going to make all sorts of mistakes, so to speak, compared to the conventional way of doing things, but that's no problem. You know, there's no need to do it the conventional way unless you want to make those conventional sounds. I'm not saying conventional in a bad sense. The conventional ways are the beautiful way. But I'm sure there's many beautiful ways to do it, and perhaps by ignoring all that and just trying it, you'll find some new ways to do it because there's no need to do it some specific way unless you want to do it some specific way. So different people will be different and they'll. some people will want to jump in and they've probably already done that or this is the push they need. Other people will feel like, right, okay, maybe I'll take the tack that Max took and just study a little bit and get some background on it, whatever, before I try. Regardless, it doesn't really matter. 
you're just going to have to do it. You're just going to start getting your hands dirty. And in getting your hands dirty, you'll find you run up against problems. You don't know how to integrate a certain instrument. You don't understand how to whatever, create these coherent lines, blah, blah, blah. There's all sorts of things that can come across in, in trying to do that work. So I don't have any, uh, I don't have any life-changing tip that this is the one. It's just a matter of, are you the kind of person that needs background first, or are you the kind of person that just needs to jump in? And if you are that kind of person, then just do that. <laughs> and if not, if you are the kind of person that wants to study first, then do that too. The, the end result is that you will do it the way that makes sense to you, the way that feels good and sounds good to you, and there's no need to worry about that. You know, there's no need to follow any particular ways of doing it, playing instruments in their upper ranges or in their lower ranges, or you know, making sure you've got your horn section balanced with your string section. All that's cool, but you could also just ignore that all and just do whatever you want, and that's cool too. All right, next question. So this is about ear training. This person says, I've worked with Complete Ear Trainer and Functional Ear Trainer, the apps that you prescribe in uh, Warp Drive Part 1, which is one of my courses. I hit a wall with both of these and have been working separately with my instructor to, with my instructor to do solfege with different major scales, reciting each scale with and without accompaniment. I've also worked playing intervals with different instruments and pitches in my DAW. I'm wondering if it's helpful to work with multiple instruments when ear training, and what's your recommendation to supplement outside of the apps? All right, so the hitting a wall thing in terms of ear training is happens to everybody. Everybody's going to hit a wall because this hitting of a wall means there's some degree of subconscious integration that is still ongoing, and there's nothing you can do about that other than basically remind your brain that you're you're desiring to do this still, you know? So you touch in every once in a while and you try the exercises again and you play them on your instrument and all this. And something happens in the background through doing that. But the speed at which that happens in the background is you have no control over that. Even if you were to practice every single day, all day, that doesn't mean you're going to learn it any faster. It really doesn't. It might even be slower because you get burned out. Who knows? It's, it's, it's a natural thing that simply takes time. It takes familiarity and exploration and I too got stuck on many walls, and I'm sure I will get stuck on many more walls as I was trying to work through hearing intervals, hearing scale degrees, hearing certain chord types, chord movement, bass notes, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's it's very complex in a certain sense, right? There's just so many combinations uh, of notes in music. And so it's just a matter of gentleness. Just be gentle and understand that there's something going on that you don't have control over. You're simply taking in the sounds and desiring a certain outcome and the rate at which that outcome comes to you isn't up to you and there's no, no need to beat yourself up about it or get frustrated with that because there's nothing you can do about it it's just how it is you know it's like if you if you wanted to be uh when you're a kid and you want to be tall but you're short and what are you gonna do <laughs> you just gotta wait until you grow there's nothing that can be done for you to accelerate that process and you don't need to accelerate the process. Just let the natural process take its time and it will do what it needs to do. Um, for me working with the apps, A, I mean, I worked with, with apps obsessively from the time I first started ear training when I was 20 or something, which I was very late to that game as far as, I started playing music when I was young, but I didn't do any ear training for a long time. It wasn't until I saw some video of someone saying, hey, you know, ear training is kind of like the most important part of playing music, probably. And I thought, hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're right. And then I started uh, getting the apps and I obsessed about them and did it in every waking moment when I got up, going to bed on the, waiting in line in between work gigs, whatever it happened to be, I was, I was ear training all the time, hitting walls, getting frustrated, blah, 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 the whole thing like everybody does. So I have a lot of experience with the apps. I can say that I didn't uh, switch instruments in the apps. I know some of the apps allow you to switch from piano to guitar to strings to whatever. I never did any of that. Um, don't know why, never crossed my mind. Maybe it's good to do, probably is, so maybe you should if that feels of interest to you. But you can also know that I didn't do that, and somehow uh, a lot of this still became possible for me anyway. Um, yeah, so it just depends on who you are. Outside of the apps, the question says, is there something that would be good to do outside of the apps? Yeah, of course. The number one thing to do is try to transcribe real music. Uh, whether that's melodies, whether that's bass lines, whether that's chords and chord progressions or whatever, rhythms even, 
Transcribing by ear is the goal, right? Whether you're transcribing music you're listening to in the exterior world or music you hear in your mind, it's the same sort of thing. You're transcribing what is, um, let's call it sound, even in your mind, into concepts so that you can put them on the instrument. So that's that's where the real learning happens. Even if you're an ace at your ear training apps, the issue with ear training apps is that they, these exercises generally exist in isolation. So you're training on a fifth or a minor ninth chord or some whatever, but it's just bang, floating in free space. You know, it's, music doesn't do that, basically. So a lot of people have the experience of becoming good at the apps and then trying to go to real music and being like, wow, I can't do this at all. Because yeah, like the chords are spread across many instruments. They're with voicings you never heard before. They're constantly changing. It's not just bang. You know, as someone's playing an arpeggio while a string holds over top, and there's a vocal melody and the bass is moving, right? So the complexities of real music are vast. And so there's a certain point at which you just got to start trying that because that's a kind of learning experience that the app isn't going to give you uh, is this full-on contextual stuff, really. And so... You start by trying to get melodies by ear, just simple melodies, or an individual chord, or what even is the tonic of the song I'm listening to, like what is the key, working out the key. And you just use absolutely everything that you know to try to work this out. That means your instinctive sense of like, oh, I think that sounds like minor, before you even analyze it, it's just this, ooh, this sound, right, this feeling. And then all of your theory knowledge comes to bear on that as well. Because the way the whole ear training thing works is that in, re in real music, that is, you're, you're looking to perceive a landmark by which you can orient yourself to a kind of map of a key with tonal music anyway. That's generally how that works. So this landmark could be anything. It could be you hear, oh, that's the tonic I'm hearing right now, or that's a major chord, or I'm hearing a fifth in the melody, or that bass note is the fourth of the key, or anything, or even as I heard a half step. Because if you heard a half step, it's quite possible that that's one of the two half steps in the key. So you might be hearing three and four, or seven and one, as far as a major scale goes. Um, all that stuff can be, of course, confounded by many other factors that come to bear on it, which makes the whole process difficult. But still, you're looking for a landmark by which you can get some foothold in, and then you start to make guesses and estimate and estimates that you then try to work out. For instance, you hear suddenly you hear a minor chord. You know that in a major scale, minor chords happen on two, three, and six. So that narrows down your possibilities. You think this is six, two, or three, and then you, if you can get nothing else but that, but but you know one chord is minor. I should say a single chord is minor. You take that and you make a guess and you say, you know, okay, what if this chord is the six? If that was the six, that must mean that this next one is the three or the one, let's say, because it's, I can hear the bass note goes up just a little bit and the chord feels major. And the next major chord above the six is the one. So maybe that's that. And then you say, but okay, so if those two are that, then maybe that makes this this, and that makes this this, and so on. So it's a bit like a Sudoku or something. You know, you're trying to find a landmark, piece together a bit of a map, and then test your guess, test your guesses with your own internal logic, basically saying, hmm, if this is this, and this is this, this must be this, and so on, so on, so on. At some point, you may run into a wall and be like, hmm, I see. Now I can clearly hear this note is the tonic, and I thought it was this one. And that means all this is wrong. So that initial chord is not the six, it's actually the two. And that means that chord that I heard after it was actually the four. And that means this is the tonic and then it all starts to come together. And you say, ah, it all makes sense from that perspective. Suddenly you're starting to get it. The melody becomes more obvious, blah, blah, blah. This is, I'm just giving a general example. This can apply to melody, to bass lines, to whatever. But this is the process. It's one of finding landmarks, orienting yourself, and then using anything you possibly can in your bag of tricks and knowledge to make headway in building a map of what you're hearing and then you need some way to test the map and in the end whatever that is for the current thing you're trying to do say it's chords you want if possible some way to actually 
test that against um, an answer key, so to speak, which is what the apps are good for. But again, they're not contextual. So, excuse me. In the case of in the case of chords, you might test your answers against, uh, depending on what kind of music is, sheet music for it, a lead sheet for it, guitar tabs for it, the chord chart for it, whatever it happens to be. Um, you want some way to be like, this is what I think, but what do other people think? Now, other people might be wrong too. That's another confounding factor, but at least it will give you some sense. And then you try their chords versus your chords and so on. Because uh, there's just so much complexity here and there's so many ways to be fooled and whatever that you have to be. You have to be fooled and get it wrong over and over and over and over and over again unless you're the kind of person that has such a good ear that you don't have to do that, in which case there's no point in you even listening to me say this right now. But for the most of us, that's kind of how it goes. So outside of apps, um, it's doing real music, transcribing real music like I've just described. It's singing and playing against drones while being very conscious of what it is that you're singing and hearing. I'll have some videos on this soon. Sounding a drone, singing the fifth over top of it, singing the root, singing the fifth, singing the tonic, singing the fifth, singing the tonic, then the third and the fifth, and the third and the fifth, the third, the fourth, the third, the fourth, you know, things like this, being conscious of what you're doing. But remember that the actual work that's being done is behind the scenes. You're not there to, to get something intellectually that you're going to be able to hang on to and say, oh, now I, now I always know a fifth. It's just this. That whole part goes on in some mysterious way where all of a sudden you look back and you realize, hey, I can always hear the fifth now. It's no problem at all. And I don't even really know how I did it other than I just kept hearing it again and again. And suddenly you can just do it. It's like a baby learning to speak. The baby hasn't even learned how to have conceptual frameworks yet. So how does it learn to speak the language, it just suddenly surprises itself. The words just start coming out. You say it in this context and everyone goes, yay. And you say it in that context and they go, mm, yeah. And this sort of sensual feeling it out experience. It's very akin to this. Although of course we have conceptual frameworks to help us, but the real work goes on, the real work goes on behind the scenes, so to speak in a way that I don't understand at all. I can just say that the results feel like magic. You do this stuff and it seems like I'm not making headway and it's annoying and it's boring or it's whatever. And then all of a sudden you're able to just sing something or recognize something or feel something out and you say, damn, okay, this is actually like working. And then later on, it really starts to feel like magic. And there's the sense that music becomes understandable. Music becomes something that is that is in you. You hear it and you know what you're hearing. You hear in your mind and you know what it is. You know how to produce it. You know, it's it's honestly a, it's a wonder. And then lastly, as outside of singing with drones, playing and exploring chords on an instrument is, and melody notes and all that is pretty invaluable. And if you don't play an instrument, that's tough because then you have to, you know, draw everything out in your DAW or whatever. I mean, it's really worth being able to at least play some basic chords on a piano or a guitar or something in order to, to hear these things. Piano is better because you can be so specific with your voicings and you're not limited by the way the guitar is tuned. You can still do it on guitar though, of course. And seeing how they're constructed, being able to look at them and say, right, that's the one, that's the five, that's the seven, that's the nine. And you can play the nine over and over and over again. Play the chord, play it, play the chord, play it, you know, like this. That kind of thing is just, that's where, the, that's where it happens. So this combination of the apps, with transcribing real music, singing and playing over drones, and uh, exploring chords and structures and intervals and whatever on a real instrument and hearing them and thinking about them and so on. This is the process that's been for me. So essentially, to, to sum it up, you come from every angle. The more angles and perspectives you can take on the thing, the better. And they all interrelate in such nuanced and complex ways that you can't even speak what they are. It's just this happening, this mysterious happening that goes on and all of a sudden it just integrates somehow and suddenly you say, hey, I can actually do that now. And that's amazing. And you will, you will be able to do it unless, you know, it's, there's a rare kind of person perhaps who's not going to be able to, to do very well with ear training at all. And if that's the case for you, then that's the case for you. And then you pursue some other avenue of creating music if, if that's what's of interest to you. It's not a requirement that you're able to do this. Some people can do it very easily. Other people, it's very difficult and takes time. But in the end, it doesn't matter because if you are the kind of person 
who's expressed with a desire to be able to do it, you just have to work with the abilities that nature provides you. That's it. It doesn't matter if other people can do it 10 times faster than you. You still got to do it. So you're just going to work through it. But that rate at which you're going to learn it is not a fault of yours. It's not your, it's not a problem. It's not something wrong with you. It's just the way that you are expressed by nature and you work with that. That's fine. That means you're going to have abilities in other areas that other people find difficult uh, in communication and business in drawing and whatever, driving a car or something like that, right? That they're going to find difficult. And this might be some area that is difficult for you. And that just is what it is. It's no problem. It was very difficult for me. I can tell you that I had absolute trash ear when I was younger, trash, trash, trash compared to all my friends. I couldn't work out songs by ear. I couldn't match pitches with my voice. It was rough. <laughs> it was real rough, but now it's a bit smoother. All right, that's it for the uh, ear training question. Next question. For someone wanting to switch to Studio One, what would you say is the cost of entry to start producing music like your Jazz Fusion Dorian video or the chill jazzy groove fusion you've been working on lately, including bare minimum required plugins, instruments, and minimum software version? I got FL Studio years ago for the ease of making beats, but I find recording instruments on it to be a nightmare full of latency and the workflow is stellar for loops, but really holds me back from horizontal production. Wish I could sell it back to them. Yeah, I mean, that's how I, feel, I would feel too about FL. I have FL because of work. Uh, I've used it here and there, but I, sorry, FL fans, it's just it's not working for me. I'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, so required plugins in order to make Fusion. Of course, you have to somehow cover the instruments, and Fusion is a big world, obviously, right? What, what is Fusion? It could be anything. So we'll just say the kind of fusion that was mentioned in the videos uh, that he's talking about, these videos that I did. So in that kind of fusion, obviously you need to cover keyboard sounds, bass, like bass guitar sounds, even bass synth sounds, um, synthesizers in general for leads and chords and whatever else, and some maybe acoustic instruments, horns, maybe even strings, uh, I don't know, whatever else, guitars if you're not a guitar player, if you need that. And the cost of these things obviously varies massively depending on if you're going to use the stock instruments that come with your DAW, which if you're decent at programming and you got a good ear, you can make great use of the stock instruments. Don't let that be a hindrance to you. And in fact, trying to start with those at first is really beneficial because it, it A, shows you which instruments you really do need to buy because they're just not living up to your standard of sound quality. And it also teaches you how to manipulate MIDI in such a way as to find solutions to problems you encounter in order to get the sound you're after. So starting with, with stock plugins is huge. I mean, I, I really recommend it. Anyway, um, of course, buying higher quality instruments is always the better option if you're able, because then you don't have to buy another one later. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I use, I've had for 13 years, 14 years, you know, the, some of the instruments that I use. My bass instruments come from Trillion, which is made by Spectrosonics, people who make Omnisphere, but it's old plugin. Uh, but they sound awesome. And I have no need for other ones. I'm sure there's a ton of other modern bass guitars that are out there that sound great, probably better than what I'm using. But I don't ever encounter the experience of when I'm using what I've got where I say, damn, I need to upgrade this. It just sucks. You know, I don't have that. So I spent the money initially. I've been happy for whatever it is, 15 years or something with it. Same with a bunch of the stuff. So keys, of course, Keyscape would be my number one recommendation. It's got so many different types, especially the ones you want to use in Fusion. But buying something like Native Instruments Complete is an easy solution because it's going to provide a huge range of sounds, one upfront, you know, fairly sizable investment, but then you've got stuff to work with for a very long time. Even just getting contact, Native Instruments Contact, will already give you a ton of stuff, especially in the acoustic realm, uh, which it's nice to have sort of a base level acoustic library that you can pull almost any instrument from. And though it might not be world class in terms of uh, virtual instruments. It's good enough that, you know, with clever programming and clever arranging, perhaps you can hide the fact that it's a virtual instrument. Um, yeah, cost is obviously highly variable on all these factors. And when you buy them, holding out for sales is obviously huge. <laughs> it's pretty important, but sometimes you just got to have it and then you buy it at full price and whatever. That is what it is. And then in terms of switching to Studio One, like you may as well just get the latest version um, because it's quickly going to become outdated. It just happens, you know, whatever one you buy, it's already going to become outdated. So you may as well buy the latest. And then the question is, 
if for me, would be artist version or professional version. Uh, if you go for the uh, subscription, PreSonus Plus or whatever they call it, then of course you get the professional version and you get everything. And that's a simple solution other than it's subscription and some people don't like that. Otherwise, you'd be fine off with the artist version. And because uh, if you're going to be using a lot of external plugins or if you've got your own sounds and whatever, like it's that's no problem and you can always upgrade in the future. So anyway, it's a pretty pretty nuanced question. I won't go into any more specifics about it, but if this person happens to have more specific questions, you can just tag me in the Discord or tag whoever and we'll talk about it. The most important part in making this kind of music, in making any kind of music, is the composition of it, is, is you know understanding how to write the music through listening to it, through understanding the theory if you need to do that, um, and being able to manipulate the instruments to get the sound you want. So the desire to produce the music obviously is essential. The ear for what it should sound like to you, what you what you want it to sound like is essential because then that's your guiding light when you're working on it. It's going to say, this horn is close but not right. So long as you never settle for close but not right, you will simply find solutions. And if that means you need to abandon using horns and use a synth instead, then you'll do that. What that means is that, yeah, you're not going to get your initial idea, but you're going to get something that sounds better overall given the... Uh, limitations that you have to work with. So focusing on the composition of it is by far more important than the software and plugins you're using. I mean, just, there's no competition. Uh, next question. This is about visualization on instruments. This person says, sometimes I'm trying to learn melodies when I'm not close to any instrument. Since I'm primarily a guitar player, it's easiest to do that while visualizing the fretboard. It also seems easier since the melody will look the same in any key and you can just see the pattern. Lately, I've been trying to learn how to play piano better and it's a mess when I try to visualize melodies on it since pattern looks completely different depending on the key. Since you're also a guitarist that switched to piano, I'm wondering on which instrument do you visualize things you hear in your head if you even do? Do you just choose a random key on the piano and in your head and do it there? Is it more abstract to you? Is the answer basically practice everywhere a lot so you no longer even have this kind of question and all is music and music is all? Or uh, or I would love to hear your thoughts on the process behind it, how your transition from guitar to piano looked like and any tips in general. So just to clarify, I didn't switch from guitar to piano. I switched from piano to guitar. I took piano as a kid. I quit that. I picked it up again when I was 13, right before I started playing guitar, actually, as well. And so I was learning, I'd already learned how to visualize a piano keyboard to some degree when I was younger. And then I started visualizing in earnest in terms of visualizing chords on the uh, piano way before guitar. On guitar, when I was starting, I was just learning chord shapes and just calling them whatever name <laughs> I was told to call them. I didn't know what any of the notes are, I didn't know what any of the, the degrees are or anything. But on piano already, I was thinking of 135 and all this in order to build the chords because I was playing sort of pop and rock stuff. So the experience of learning uh, real music on the piano in a pop, rock, folk, country, blah, 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 chord-based style that is not classical, not from sheet music, but from chord names, that was the most instructive thing for me because I had to build those chords initially, find ways to invert the right hand so that they were all uh, able to be played smoothly, and then play them a lot in order to be able to play along with the songs that I was listening to. And just doing that for a bunch of songs taught me how to build almost every triad very quickly because they just show up in all the different keys. And then I was working on building scales and you know, just I knew the formula for scales. So I would work on root note, then or tonic, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 blah, 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 do this on various keys and so on. Over the years, I would do all these exercises and that built up a basis of being able to basically say, name a tonic, and if you can pick that note, call it B flat, then any other note on the keyboard, immediately there comes the sense of which degree it is in relation. That's the flat seven, that's the three, that's the flat five, that you know, blah, blah, blah. It's just like this, right? That comes through having, having had to build those chords, playing the scales, doing that a lot, and eventually starting to number everything in this way so that when I was playing, any single thing I would play, I would say, what's the root and what are the rest of these degrees? What's the root and what are the rest of these degrees? If I'm playing a melody, I'm saying, right, I'm in the key of C minor. This is flat three, two, flat three, five, four, five, flat seven, five. Always being aware of this, it just becomes so fast eventually where it's just 
whatever the root or tonic is of the moment, everything else is obvious. Um, even before I know what the name of the note is, almost, I know what the degree is. This is probably the way it is for a lot of people that play piano. I don't know. On guitar, I also spent a very long time um, working on fretboard visualization because I played for a long time before I really worked on that. I was even teaching for quite a number of years before I started to get serious about knowing what I'm playing. And this is huge for guitar players. Most, I shouldn't say most, but many guitar players don't know what they're doing as far as the theory of it goes. And that's no problem. That's fine. Obviously, people go their whole life not knowing what they're doing on guitar and make a whole career out of it. And everybody's happy. I'm happy with that, too. That's cool. For what I want to do, though, I did want to be able to know what I was playing. So I started trying to always know that. Always know what key I'm in, what degree I'm playing, name these notes, you know, the letter names and so on. It's a pretty slow slog on the guitar for various reasons I won't go into, but any guitarist knows why because of the guitar's layout. It's very pattern-based and that, that's a crutch that you can lean on very easily. But that same crutch of the pattern-based thing does also help you get the numbers down and the note names down in various ways. So in terms of what do I see in my head when I think about music, I see a piano keyboard, no doubt about it. I Unless I'm, I'm going to play a guitar song, then I'll, of course, visualize on the guitar. But otherwise, the piano keyboard is unbeatable in terms of visualizing structures of all kinds, scales and chords and baseline relationships and inversions and such. I don't even know what it's like to not do that. So probably there are people that only play guitar and they play at a very high level and it all makes total sense to them uh, about visualiz visualizing all that on the guitar. And it does make sense to me too, but I don't Given the two, I will always choose piano. In fact, give me a chord name. What I immediately see is how it lays across the keys. And from there, I'm able to determine all the degrees of those notes, all the note names of those notes, and I apply that to the guitar. I actually do it that way most of the time, unless it's some shape that I'm already familiar with that I just grab instinctively on the guitar. So yeah, the piano is huge for me in visualization. In terms of what key do I visualize in? I don't know. It just depends on on what I'm doing or what I've done recently. If I've been playing in B flat, I see it there. Playing in G minor, I see it there. First thing in the day, and I'm not doing anything, I probably see it in C major. That's probably where I normally see C major and C minor, just because it's so easy to visualize. And the way that the white keys compare to the black in terms of diatonic major scale notes versus modal notes, you know, it's it's such a good system for being able to understand the relationship between them that it's hard to beat. Now, in terms of uh, how do I move from guitar to piano with some particular something, we could call it a melody at first. It's simple. Um, and there's two ways to go. One is note names and one is scale degrees. I will always choose scale degrees over the other. I feel it's more flexible. So when I'm, when I'm playing a melody on guitar or even just hearing one, but we'll go with guitar to translate. If I'm playing a melody on guitar, I'm constantly aware of what degree of the scale I'm on. I mean, I, I really don't play anything without knowing that. It's just instinctive at this point. So I know that it's going one, three, one, two, blah, 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 blah. And then that is what the melody is to me when I'm trying to translate. From there, it's no problem at all to translate into any key on the piano instantly when it's codified in this scale degrees number notation because the numbers on the piano are just like this. So could easily play the melody in any key instantly. And probably the vast majority of piano players that have a theory background can do that. Of course, I'm not saying that's special. That's just how it works. And chord, a chord is the same. If there's any kind of particular voicing on the guitar, um, even say uh, just a straight up regular bar chord from the, from the low E string. If you know your numbers, one, five, one, three, five, one, that's that major bar chord shape, then that's what that is to me, one, five, one, three, five, one. And, and then, then it can just be applied to anything. So that's a good practice to have. Take a structure that you know well on the guitar, figure out the numbers, take that over, play it in C major, and then try to play it in other keys and just through this familiarization, you will make a connection between tonics or roots and all the other notes being some relationship to them, some kind of number relationship to it. Same with the guitar. If you can get that translation layer, which is the scale degree sort of zone, then 
it just goes like this back and forth. If you can visualize scale degrees on the guitar or on the piano, it's not some big deal to translate between them, but it will be slow at first. 100% it will be slow at first, and there's nothing you can do about that. You're unfamiliar with it. What can you say? And I started playing, uh, playing piano at a pretty young age, so it was already happening for me to some degree, um, even before I was a teenager. So I don't know. I don't know what it's like to do it in any other way, but that would be my recommendation. Of course, you can also do it with note names, and if you can't name the notes on a piano instantly, I mean, you got to Got, that's got to be way up on the list of priorities. I mean, you got to be able to pick any note at random and instantly, bang, you say what that is. And you, you generally want that to be the case for scale degrees too. It's just that note names are absolute, where scale degrees are relative. It's always relative to some given tonic, obviously. And the exact same on the guitar. You want to be able to look at a fret and say, that's A sharp. Or you want to be able to look at a fret and know you're in a certain key and say, that's the seven. That kind of stuff is is the whole deal when it comes to this translation between the two instruments. Um, yeah, so I guess that's all I have to say on that. It's really worth the trouble, though. <laughs> Next question is, what is the most important skill to develop when learning how to use a DAW? The most important skill to develop is patience. <laughs> Basically, it's very confusing. It's, it's so many things, and especially if you're coming to music, uh, music production, Without a previous musical background, you know, you got your work cut out for you. You got to climb, as I would say, three mountains at once. You have the technical mountain about using computers and files and all this and how to literally use the DAW and, and manipulate it and whatever. Then you have a musical mountain to climb about uh, notes and chords and scales and the relationship and all this. And then you have the uh, mixing mountain to climb about EQ and compression and reverb and volume and automation and all this stuff. So it's about patience and being gentle with yourself. And depending on where you are in your musical process, what I said will either reply to you or some aspect of it will be covered already or whatever. And there's, you know, it's, that sounds a bit um, like a weak answer of patience is the thing, but it's the thing. You will get it. You will get it. It's just a matter of persistence and being gentle and understanding this is complex. This is just complex. Nobody's going to say it's not, unless they're trying to sell you a YouTube video, basically. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, if you're being serious, this is complex to do. It is going to take you time. That's fine. It takes everybody time. Let it take time. Next question. What are the top three to five plugins or tools to consider when working in a DAW? Well, of course, you need to be able to generate sounds. So you need some kind of synthesizer or sampler or whatever in order to actually produce sound. So that's essential, obviously. Uh, how to manipulate volume is got to be second in command after producing the sound because mixing is like 80% just volume balancing, getting something to sound nice, making sure your melody against the drums, against the chords, against the bass, against the percussion, against whatever. If you can get really nice volume balance and nothing else, it's pretty good already. Like honestly, fully listenable. From there, um, you know, you you want an EQ, which is going to come with your DAW, in order to, at the very least, filter out frequencies that you don't don't need in a certain instrument. So if anyone's new to production and you don't know that, you know, if you're playing like a piano, but it's not solo piano, it's actually in a mix, and it's not playing bass notes, you may as well cut out all the frequencies kind of up until whatever, it will be different for every mix, but let's just say up until the lowest note that you're going to play. And even sometimes you want to cut into the lowest notes you're playing because you want the harmonics of those notes to ring out, like you want the listener to know that they're being played, but you don't want the fundamental frequencies of those notes to be muddying up the mix in that lower zone. The same goes for a higher zone uh, with bass and various instruments. So EQ, from a filtering perspective, as well as from a cutting, uh, competing frequencies, cutting harsh frequencies, boosting nice frequencies, you know, it's a pretty important tool, obviously. I'm not saying anything groundbreaking here. The next would be a reverb. And reverb has such a transformative effect on music, it's, it can't be overstated. You know, like if you've got nice instruments, a good volume mix, you've EQ'd a little bit. The next thing you can do to improve it, some would say compression, I would say reverb. Reverb is going to transform the sound of the thing into 
into feeling real, into having depth and space and relationship, and even to have more ambient qualities and emotional qualities by letting notes ring out. I mean, it's just so transformative and it's so fun to play with. And it's also um, a weak spot for many DAWs in terms of their stock plugins for reverb are usually not the best. And that's pretty, that's pretty high recommendation for a first, I mean, not a first, but purchasing early on. If you're going to purchase new mixing plugins, reverb is pretty high on the list to get a nice one, no doubt. And then having a limiter. Limiter is essential, of course, just to get your music to be loud enough. Uh, even if you don't even have compression going on in the mix, at least you can push into a limiter so that you can get to the loudest that that track can be without clipping. It's pretty simple. And if you don't know how any of that works, it's worth looking up limiters, clipping, DAW or something in YouTube and just watching something. That's That would be my top five things. Generating sound through some means, controlling volume, controlling frequency balance via EQ, adding reverb for space and dimension and whatever else you want to call that, and then a limiter in order to push up into it. If that's all you had, even if you never did compression, even if you never did chorusing and phasing and flanging and delays and granular stuff and whatever, you can still make like great music that people actually want to listen to with just those basic tools because the most important part is composition. And that's what this next question is. In your opinion, what is the most important skill to develop as you begin a journey towards music production? Composition is the most important skill by far. I mean, I will listen to great music that was recorded on like a VHS, you know, th third generation re-recording of a VHS posted on YouTube in 240p. I listen to that like every day, and I do certain recordings because the music is just so good. The composition, the improvisation, whatever it happens to be, is just so fulfilling to me that I don't really care. Yeah, I would love for it to be in higher quality. That'd be great, but it's not, and I will <laughs> deal with it. But there's no music that I listen to that is of pristine quality in terms of instrument and, and mixing and all that, but the composition is shit. Like, it just doesn't happen. I don't care to do that. The only reason I would listen to that music is for the mix. So I can reference my mix against it, and I do do that. But as far as putting a song on at home or in the car or something like that, I mean, that's simply never going to happen. So there's no contest. I mean, it's very easy to get caught up in the, you could call it objective, measurable parts of music production because they can give you values and readouts, and you can say yes or no. This is a good value. That's a bad value. You should be getting this much gain reduction, you know, you should have your frequency spectrum look like this and not like this. You know, these things that are like not subjective, not subtle, not nuanced. They're just basically hard facts compared to some people would say anyway, that you can just base your decisions on. That's all well and good. I'm not saying don't do that, but compared to the subtle, subjective, nuanced component of composition, they don't hold a candle. All that can come later. You can learn that anytime. You can learn composition anytime too. But if you're going to put an order of operations, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's got to be the music first. It's got to be the melodies, the rhythms, the bass line, the notes, the drums, the chords, the whatever. All that stuff has such a more profound effect on the listener than does all the fancy toys and, and getting the mix to be just so, you know. And probably along with that, along with composition, I would say attention to detail. This is something that is difficult to do usually when people are first starting out because there's so much going on in music production that it's hard to want to devote the time to taking care of every little detail. And a lot of times you don't even know what the details are, right? You're, you're new to the thing and there's a sense that this is just, oh, I've just, I made something. Isn't that just the best? It is the best. It's super cool to have just made anything, made a beat. You know, I used to want to make things as fast as possible. I didn't want to spend a long time on it. That's boring. I want to like do the fun part and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the attention to detail is where all of the, I don't know, depth comes from all, it's necessary. You know, every, as far as I'm concerned, and now this, people will disagree with this, it's fine. From my perspective, this is my question and answer, taking care of every detail, you know, how every drum sounds, how exactly the bass tone sounds and where it sits, is it going to, when the bass is going to pop up, is it going to pop up an octave? Is it going to pop up a fifth? 
He's going to pop up a six, down to a fifth, blah, blah, blah. Every little thing matters, you know. When in this chord, is the extension a ninth or is the extension an eleventh? That has a profound effect on the emotional feeling of the moment. And for as long as you make music, more opportunities for detail orientation present themselves because you become aware of more subtlety over time. And that subtlety opens avenues to take care of things as opposed to just letting the thing be random, essentially. It's like even playing an instrument. When you're learning guitar, at first, you're not even aware of all the subtleties uh, and things that you could pay attention to. There's just the sense of, am I playing the note? <laughs> Do I have my finger on the right fret? And did I pluck it, basically? You don't even, honestly, you don't even know, notice that when you pluck it, all the other strings are ringing out. You're so focused on this, that this noise in the background is not noticeable to you until someone points it out to you and says, hey, you know, you got to be muting those strings. Suddenly you start to orient to that and you realize, wow, you know, muting of strings, this is a world. You know, this is like the next years of your life is about how do you mute strings, basically. And then it just becomes more and more fine and more and more fine. Where are you picking? What kind of pick are you using? Where are you placing your finger? Are you sliding into it? Are you bending into it? How are you bending into it? How fast is it? Is your intonation on? What kind of guitar are you using? What are the electronics? What's the amp? What are your settings on your knobs? Blah, blah, blah. You know, all of this, when you listen to the music that you love, or, you know, usually I would say the music that you love and great players, they are taking care of all these things as a matter of course, because as they've practiced, this whole world has opened up as, as opportunities uh, to refine to pay attention to the little details. That's not to say that there aren't players that play in a very, or compose in a very raw, unfiltered, unrefined fashion, and the music is, isn't great. That absolutely happens, no doubt about it. For my sensibilities, I'm the kind of person that does want to take care of every little detail and polish and do that. Other people won't want to, and they'll still make great music, and that's totally fine. But from my perspective, I love that part of it. And that part of it adds so much to the whole thing. You know, for me, it's pretty much essential. Do you feel that playing, creating music is a talent or a skill? So here I would assume that talent is referring to natural ability, uh, whereas skill is some kind of, you know, practiced, refined thing. And so obviously playing music is a skill. Composing music is a skill. However, the talent for music, the natural ability for music, is a real thing. Whether that real thing is truly just from birth or from the family you grew up in, whatever it happens to be, the environment you were in, some combination of factors is absolutely making it possible for certain people to have an easier entrance point into developing the skills of, of playing and uh, composing music. There's no way to get around that. You see it everywhere. You see it everywhere. Especially if you spend time teaching music, you see a vast gulf between natural ability and people to pick up, comprehend what they're hearing, reproduce certain things, pay attention to detail, have a sensibility for put this chord here and not here, put this snare hit there and not there. You know, that sort of thing is whatever it is. And if you are blessed to have great natural ability, then you are. And if you aren't, then you aren't. But that's not a problem. That's not a fault of yours. That's not something wrong with you. That's just the natural expression that you are, and you have to work with that. What that means is that that person who, for whom it is not super easy may have to work harder in some sort of conventional sense, but the limitations placed on that person through their so-called lack of ability means that they will pr produce, they will create a different kind of music that is shaped by their limitations and the issues that they ran into in their life. And the person for whom music comes so naturally and it all just flows and makes sense and whatever, they're still going to have to work hard to be a great musician. There's no one, there's no one who's going to tell you that's not true. But their, their own makeup will make it so that the type of music they're making is what matches their nature, what matches their expression. And if that was easy for them, then fine. And if it was difficult for you or for me to 
get to some form of music that we're happy with, then whatever, that's what it is, you know. And I realize this, the question is not asking about this particularly. The question is, do you feel that playing as a mu music is a talent or a skill? It's a skill, but the talent, so to speak, plays into it in a huge way, at least initially. Past a certain threshold, I mean, I listen to a ton of uh, master musicians speak through interviews, master classes, lessons, whatever. I just want to hear anybody on any instrument who's been doing this for decades talk about it. I feel there's huge value in doing that, even if you don't play that instrument. And f almost universally, people will say, if I have some natural talent, then okay. But basically everything came from just dedication and, and working hard at it. And maybe, you know, there was some kind of head start in the beginning or someone has perfect pitch or someone grew up singing in choirs and that plays into it. But if you're someone who's 50, whatever, 60 years old, you never played any music before at all, and you're starting now, that's fine. That's the set of limitations that you're going to have to work with, and it's going to shape what you do and how you do it. And by working in that set of limitations, you will create something interesting, something beautiful that makes sense to you and, and is an expression of these limitations. And you may even start to see that the so-called limitations are a kind of strength. They're, they're a kind of way that your own unique sound, your own unique music comes out due to the fact that you are whatever age you are and you didn't have past musical experience or something like that. Whereas someone who grew up and just had it all from the beginning, they're going to make that kind of music, whatever that happens to be for them. And that's all fine. I mean, there's no doubt that looking around the landscape of music that people listen to and create, that... A ton of people love and to listen to simple, quote unquote, simple music that is made by people who were not naturally musically gifted. It happens all the time. And then there's a lot of people who listen to music for, that is complex and crazy and done by people who were seemingly musically gifted as a child. You know, it doesn't really matter if you're that kind of person, you make that. If you're that kind of person, you make that. If you're that kind of listener, you like that. If you're, you know, so on and so forth. So I took the question in a bit of a different direction, but I still think it's worth saying, and this is the kind of point that I'm trying to reiterate on here, of course, that there's nothing wrong with your natural expression and the limitations on that you have due to the way nature has expressed you in this life. I mean, they are what they are, and those, those limitations are necessary for you to deal with. There is, you can't simply not have them, <laughs> and they will shape what you do, and often... Um, you know, from a matter of, it's a matter of perspective, I would say that they will beneficially shape what you do because just like any set of limitations you give yourself uh, when you're doing some kind of art, the limitations curtail what's possible. They make a certain play space. And so instead of, instead of everything being possible, this is possible. And you bounce off these walls and you play in here and you end up making something even more interesting, creative and fun than you would have if you had the whole world open to you. The one thing that uh, on this topic, before I leave the question, is uh, how to say this. You will have a certain degree of motivation or desire to practice music, to develop your skill, let's say, in your abilities. And that amount of motivation and desire is not something that you can control. And it fluctuates constantly, as anyone will know. You have some times when it's just bang, burning, and you just got to do it. Other times when you just couldn't care less and you're into whatever else, something else. Some people are just expressed with an intense desire to do this their whole life, and there's nothing they can do about that. That's not their creation. They didn't decide to have that burning desire, and you didn't decide, or I didn't decide, to have the desire that I have to whatever degree it is. And that, there's no getting around that. Even if someone that you really respect and you look up to comes to tell you and says like, you know, you got to want this more. What are you going to do <laughs> to want it more? You know, you can try to convince yourself that you should want it more, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to want it more. You know, this you just have the desire that you have and that's what you have to work with. And if that means you take six months off of music sometimes, then that's simply what happens. And you develop other skills and you have fun in other ways during that time. And other people don't take that six months off and that's just the way they're expressed. So again, it's a matter of just 
gentleness, understanding that all of these factors, roughly speaking, are not something that you get to decide, and you just work with the way you are expressed, and that's fine, totally fine. All right, so I'm quickly gonna run through these personal questions here. Um, do you have any other creative interests other than music? What new hobbies would you like to try? Yeah, other creative interests? I'm, I'm interested in, in all kinds of artistic creation. I've always, always have been. I was drawing as a kid a lot, doing visual art and filming videos, and I've always wanted to do CG, like uh, 3D graphics stuff, and writing poetry and writing stories was of interest to me at different points in my life. Anyway, I just, I, I do love all that stuff. As far as new hobbies go, um, is there any new hobbies you'd like to try? I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with the hobbies I have. Music, video games, I'm into biking and various things as well, but I don't have any sense right now that there's, that there's stuff that's outside of that that I'm itching to do or something, so yeah. Uh, have you ever wanted to take a break from music? I know it's your main job, but sometimes I allocate the time I would spend on music to playing games. Sometimes I go for a month without making music. Well, of course, I just talked about this a little bit. Have I ever wanted to take a break from music? No, uh, but that's just the way that I'm expressed, let's say. Uh, just I've never forced myself to do it. I've never been in a situation where I am forced to do it. I didn't go to music school or anything. So I never had pressure put on me, uh, and not for myself either. I've just always done it exactly in alignment with how much I want to do it. And I seem to want to do it a lot for some reason. I don't know why, I just do. And so in that way, I don't get bored of it. I don't want to take a break. That being said, I absolutely fluctuate in how I interact with it. Sometimes I'm obsessed with studying. Sometimes I'm, I'm obsessed with writing. Sometimes I'm obsessed with practicing excuse me, and playing, working on soloing, working on chords, I'm just listening, I'm ear training, all of that absolutely fluctuates all the time, like from day to day, let alone month to month, you know, and that's the case for everybody. So I just follow the natural flow and I have no issue with it. It doesn't matter to me. You know, if tomorrow I don't feel like making music for a month, that's fine because I won't feel like it. <laughs> and I'm not going to try to force myself to, to do that. I will naturally feel like doing something else, and I'll just do that. So yeah, I also play a ton of games that I, in times where I could be making music or could be studying or whatever, but obviously for whatever number of factors are playing on me at that point, that's simply what I wanna do, and that's fine with me. Uh, what dream job would you have chosen if you weren't involved in music? Growing up, I would have said theoretical physicist. That was pretty big for me because uh, sort of looking into what reality is, what life is, is pretty high on the interest as far as my life goes. It's still to this day. Uh, so perhaps some job that deals with that, though. Honestly, if I were to do a job, it would probably still be in a creative field. It might have been video or visual arts or video games creation or something like that. I really love to work on creative stuff where there's decisions to be made and the subjective interplay with the objective quality, something about that really appeals to me. Uh, so yeah, I would probably do some other creative thing. What does music mean to you? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't even know what music is and I don't know what it is that I'm feeling when I experience music. I don't know why I'm drawn to do it. Um, it's very close to my heart. It's, I can't avoid it. I love it. I, I love to listen to it. I love to think about it. I love to play it. It's just in me to do. And so what does it mean? It means everything to me in a certain sense. Um, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> That's all I can say. Do you incorporate pieces of your own life into the music you create? Um, no. But sometimes there's been times like, I know I've written some pieces of music for my wife, which was just wonderful. I love to do that. And so, of course, I'm taking feelings of my own life and I'm putting them in there. Obviously, all the experiences of my life play into what I do, but not in some sort of um, specific way. I know many people, the music they write is an expression of particular experiences or particular thoughts or particular 
regrets that they have in life. That's not my way of, of expressing at all. Um, my music is exactly what it is. <laughs> it's the experience of it. You know, that's what it is. I, I don't have a sense that it's about anything. I'm not making music about anything. And I'm not making music to express a particular viewpoint that I have on something, unless I'm asked to do that for some reason, for work or a challenge or, or something else. Otherwise, it's just the feeling of hearing it is what I like about it so much and what I strive to do with it, I, I guess. I don't know. At no point is there a sense that I'm reflecting on my life and trying to input that in. My experience of composing is of I don't even know. It's of the feelings that are generated through certain sounds that I'm experiencing and wanting to explore ways of developing, pushing against and pulling with those feelings to create something. That's as best as I can say it, honestly. And that's the way I listen to music generally, even though I there is certain songs that lyrically have a deep meaning to me personally, and I do relate to that very much about specific experiences. But when I go to write, that's not on my mind at all. Can we find the meaning of life in music? Yeah. I mean, as far as music is life itself, as, as everything is an exact demonstration of reality itself, yeah, you can absolutely find the meaning of life in music. That's a discussion for another day. What was that one piece that you really wanted to learn how to play, but you could never get to be within your skill range? When I was young, uh, 13 or something, I started listening a lot to Chopin, and there's a particular, a particular piece, opus, uh, I'm going to butcher the name, I can't even remember now. I'll post it in the comments or whatever, the description if I remember. And uh, this one thing just eh, caught me, and I said, man, this is it. Uh, it's very fast. You know, this kind of deal. Maybe you recognize it. <laughs> that that just, I said, even, even though I was very bad at playing at that time, um, and I wasn't even fast at reading music or anything, I just said, I'm going to sit down with this book, and I'm just going to learn it. I'm just going to brute force my way very, very slowly every day. And I did get the first 15 seconds or so down, of this like real fast stuff within the right hand and whatever. And, but I was eventually like, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> I'm not, I, I want to play this, but not this much. You know, I got some years to practice before I should even try this again. And uh, these days, yeah, I would still really love to be able to play that or something like that, but I don't have any deep desire that's motivating me to do that. Uh, it's just a, a fantasy you know, which I have many. Oh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to do this and do, yeah, as many things would be nice to be able to do, but I'm just not going to, unless tomorrow, for whatever reason, suddenly I find myself with a burning desire to do that. Then I will helplessly be driven to do that and I will do it. <laughs> and maybe that will happen. I don't know. What were the first steps you took when starting out on YouTube? And is it difficult to manage social media community along with your work and your personal music practice? Well, the first steps I took when out on YouTube were because people had told me I should start a YouTube channel for guitar teaching many times. And I thought that's probably a good idea. Uh, and I, I did a little bit of guitar stuff in the beginning, but really what the beginning was, was that I had been working on a business that was going to teach music production online through a certain course structure. And I had chosen Studio One for the DAW I was going to use. I put together this whole video course, or at least 80 or 90% of it. And then at some point, I, for various reasons, abandoned that whole thing. And I decided, I'm just going to put this whole course on YouTube for free and see what happens. So I released one video a day for like 80 or 90 days. And that's where the majority of uh, initial subscribers and community and everything came from, was from the Studio One music production course for free on, on YouTube. And from there, I started making other tutorials, feeling out different directions and from community response and whatever, it a bit shaped my direction in that. And then opening up the Discord community was, of course, massive for me. It was initially just 
for me and my friends to talk about music, just a closed little group. And then I decided at some point, you know what, I should just open this up to the channel, Sonic Sorcery. That all sort of took off to whatever degree that it has. And now I just love that. I just love that. So I, I'm on there, of course, every day. I'm just blown away by all the conversations people have, giving feedback to each other, discussing things, posting deals, talking about music and video games and philosophy and whatever. And it's mind boggling to me that it's even happening at all. And that it's such a, a beautiful, welcoming place to be on top of that compared to so many places on the internet. So uh, yeah, I'm very happy that things have moved in that way. And I'm continually amazed by it and have no problem spending time each day being on there responding to people and wanting I want to I want to interact with them. So that's that part's very easy for me. Um, but balancing this along with work and personal music. Yeah, that's definitely like some kind of difficult thing. As far as time goes, there's so much that I would I would want to do. I would want to make more videos more regularly, have more community events more regularly. But between work and just other life stuff, it's a bit difficult to do at times. And then that also eats into personal music practice because, yeah, for various reasons, obviously, time related, energy related. I've already been doing a lot of music stuff in the day, blah, blah, blah. All this plays into personal music practice. However, at some point, I was talking with one of my music teachers and I came to him and I said, oh, you know, I didn't have time to do the stuff you told me to do. He said, you know, if you really, and I said, I really wanted to, but I didn't have time. He said, but if you really wanted to, you'd pee less. That was what he said. And it always stuck with me. You'd pee less. So obviously, if I really wanted to work more on my personal music stuff, I would just pee less and do that. But I don't. So obviously, I don't really, really want to do that. It's more in the fantasy realm. Wouldn't it be nice if I wanted to do that? But I don't want to do that. What I want to do is apparently what I'm doing right now, ex apart from the things that, you know, obligations that perhaps I don't want to do, but are required of me. But as far as the YouTube channel goes and the community and all that, I, I love the way that it is. I wish I could do more of it. I can do more of it. Technically speaking, I could pee less and do more of it, but I don't. So if that comes to me tomorrow to want to do that, then I will. If you're thinking about making a YouTube channel, you or anybody listening to this, yeah, that's a great thing to do. Just consider a few things. The time investment, the type of personality that you are. Um, do you like to talk about things and share and show and receive feedback from comments? Because you're going to get all sorts of comments that are going to make you feel all sorts of ways. And then, like, the, honestly, the number one difficulty with, with the YouTube thing, which is so funny when you watch YouTube videos, it just all seems so obvious. Click the video, there's the person and they're speaking and they're talking to you. But when you go to film a YouTube video, A, there's all the planning, but even ignoring that, there is, just like today, before this, sitting down, turning the camera on and being like, <laughs> nobody says anything to me. No one is hyping it up. You know, that's why I love streaming so much because there's this, there's this back and forth interaction there's just go. And then you fumble on your words and you, I don't know, can't think of something. And then your lip is sticky and your nose drips and you, it's endless problems that happen. But really it's the, it's the kickstarting from the beginning that is the, the primary difficulty. I don't know if it's a difficulty, but it's, it's something to consider about that. Are you the kind of person that wants to sit in a quiet room in front of a camera and just turn on and start talking to the thing, right? Like that's a serious consideration and it's really, really a part of this. All right, the last question for today is what makes good, what makes music good to you? And maybe more interesting, what makes it bad? I mean, if what do you say about this question is very hard. I wrote down a few things just off the top of my head. What makes music good to me in terms of like my ideal music that I love most probably is a fairly equal blend of what you might call heart and intellect, meaning the sort of organic, flowy, emotional, human quality with the refined, theoretical, complex side, which is the intellect side. I really love stuff that meets right there in the middle and is both somehow deep feeling and real and authentic feeling, but also is clever and interesting and complex and uses 
interesting rhythms and and dense harmonies and you know of course i love all that stuff i also love a lot of music that doesn't do that though so that's the thing everything that i say here <laughs> i could just say the opposite and be like yeah that's also true i love you know a harmonious configuration of elements like the harmony of many things disparate things somehow being unified in a way that is really hard to articulate you know this is one of these things about composition and whatever that can you even teach that it's more of a thing that you learn through through listening and absorbing a s- music very intently you learn about how various elements cohere into a whole through some sort of harmonious balance that it's hard to even talk about but obviously that's important to me i love surprise and music surprise and taking new perspectives on what are norms cultural musical norms so we all get used to certain progressions and certain melodies and certain song structures and i do like all those things of course they become cliche because it, people like them uh, if everyone hated those things they wouldn't become a cliche but taking those things giving a little bit of them and then twisting them is something i really enjoy taking new perspectives on things that we're all already familiar with so that's pretty important to me what makes bad music a lack of coherence and harmony uh, not harmony as in chords, but as in this harmonious interrelation of parts. When a, when a piece of music just feels disjointed, like there's just uh, there's just a bunch of shit happening, <laughs> you know, it doesn't feel like like a whole. It doesn't feel like art. It doesn't feel like whatever. Right? It doesn't feel like a thing. And lack of seriousness. Not seriousness in so far as like you gotta be serious, but as far as like taking the craft seriously. To, even if you're making something funny being serious in that that means doing it well i should have put it that way in a certain sense you know i i I like i like that i like serious music i would say and music that comes off as just flippant or or as like um oh i don't know i just made this and it's stupid i'm like yeah it is stupid i don't really care about that and you know that that touches my sort of pet peeve with a lot of comedy music i'm not, not really into that that isn't to say I don't find it funny a lot of the time, depending on who's doing it, but I don't put it on to listen to. I don't sit around and be like, you know, what? I want to put on some comedy music right now. Probably a lot of people do, but I don't. And it somehow ties into this, I don't even know how to describe it, seriousness with music. Take that as you will. So yeah, that's all I've got to say about that question. It's basically, I can't say anything really true about it. Everything that I say, I could find a million examples of the opposite and be like, but in this context, blah, 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 blah. Of course, it's just the whole thing. Good music is good music. Bad music is bad music for me. What else can I say? That's it for this uh, first question and answer, possibly last question and answer. If you don't want it to be the last, just please let me know if you enjoyed it. Just leave a comment or even a like. If you have any questions that you want me to answer in the next one, should there be one, put them in the YouTube comments here. I'll collect them or go to the Discord, put them in the questions for Max area there. I appreciate you uh, being a part of the channel, watching the videos, letting me know if you like them or not. That's all very helpful for me. And if there's anything that you'd like me to make new content on or whatever, anytime, feel free to let me know. I'm happy to do that to whatever degree I'm able to. So I hope you have a good rest of your day and I'll see you soon.